Observing his actions, Mesa suspected that the soldiers were outraged by his eccentricities. Fearing that Elagavlis were killed, she would become a private citizen again. She tried to persuade the youth, who was in every respect an empty-headed young idiot, to adopt as his son and appoint as Caesar, the first cousin and her grandson, the child of her other daughter, Memea. She told the emperor what it pleased him to hear, that it was clearly necessary for him to have time to attend the worship and service of his god and devote himself to the rites and revelries and divine functions, but that there should be another responsible for human affairs to afford him leisure and freedom from the cares of empire. It was not necessary for him, she said, to look for a stranger or someone not a relative and should entrust these duties to his own cousin. It was then that the name Alexianus was changed to Alexander. The name of his grandfather became Alexander the Great, since the Macedonian was very famous and was held in high esteem, an alleged father of them both. Mesa's daughters, and the old woman too, boasted of their adultery with Antoninus, son of Severus, in order to increase the soldiers' love for the youths who thus appeared to be Elagabalus' sons. Alexander was then appointed Caesar and served as consul with Elagabalus himself. Appearing before the Senate, Elagabalus confirmed this appointment and all the senators voted approval of the fantastic and ridiculous situation they were ordered to endorse, that the emperor, who was about 16 years old, assumed the role of father to Alexander, who was 12. After adopting Alexander as Caesar, Elagabalus undertook to teach him his own practices. He instructed him in dancing and prancing and enrolling him in the priesthood, wanted the lad to imitate his appearance and actions. But his mother, Mamea, kept Alexander from taking part in activities so disgraceful and unworthy of an emperor. Privately, she summoned teachers of every subject and had her son trained in lessons of self-discipline, since he devoted himself to wrestling and physical exercise as well. He was, by his mother's efforts, educated according to both the Greek and Roman systems. Elagabalus, much annoyed at this, regretted his decision to make Alexander his son and partner in the empire. He therefore banished Alexander's teachers from the imperial palace. He put to death some of the most distinguished and sent others into exile. The emperor offered the most absurd excuses for doing this, claiming that these men, by teaching Alexander self-control, educating him in affairs, refusing to allow to dance and take part in the frenzied orgies, would corrupt his adopted son. The madness of Elagabalus increased to such a degree that he appointed all the actors from the stage and the public theaters in the most important post of the empire selecting as his praetorian prefect a man who had from childhood danced publicly in the roman theater he elevated similar fashion another young actor putting him in charge of the education and conduct of the roman youths and the qualifications of those appointed to membership in the senatorial and equestrian orders the charioteers comedians and actors of mimes he entrusted the most important and responsible imperial posts to slaves and freedmen, to men notorious for disgraceful acts, he assigned proconsular provincial governorships. With everything that had formerly had been held sacred, being done in a frenzy of arrogance and madness, all the Romans, especially the Praetorians, were angered and disgusted. They were annoyed when they saw the emperor, his face painted more elaborately than that of any modest woman, dancing in luxurious robes, effeminately, adorned with gold necklaces. As a result, they were more favorably disposed toward Alexander, for they had expected great things of a lad so properly and modestly reared. They kept continual watch upon the youth when they saw that Elagabalus was plotting against him. His mother, Mamea, did not allow her son to touch any food or drink sent by the emperor, nor did Alexander use the cupbearers or cooks employed in the palace or those who happened 
to be in their mutual service. Only those chosen by the mother, those who seemed most trustworthy, were allowed to handle Alexander's food. But Mamea secretly distributed money to the Praetorians to win their goodwill for her son. It was to gold that the Praetorians were particularly devoted. When he learned this, Elagabalus plotted against Alexander and his mother in every conceivable way. But Mesa, the grandmother of both, foiled all his schemes. She was astute in every way and had spent much of her life in the imperial palace. As the sister of Julia Domna, the deified, Mesa had always lived with the empress at the court. Therefore, none of Elagabalus' schemes escaped her attention, for the emperor was careless by nature and his intrigues were always obvious. Since his plots failed, the emperor undertook to strip Alexander of the honor of Caesar. But the youth was no longer to be seen at public addresses or in public processions. But the soldiers called for Alexander and were angry because he had been removed from his imperial post. Elagabalus circul circulated a rumor that Alexander was dying to see how the Praetorians would react to the news. When they did not see the youth, the Praetorians were deeply grieved and engraved and enraged by the report. They refused to send the regular contingent of guards to the emperor and remained in the camp demanding to see Alexander in the temple. Thoroughly frightened, Elagabalus placed Alexander in the imperial litter, which was richly decorated with gold and precious gems and set out with him for the Praetorian camp. The guards opened the gates and receiving them inside, brought the two youths to the temple and the camp. They welcomed Alexander with enthusiastic cheers, but ignored the emperor. Fuming at this treatment, although he spent the night in the camp, Elagabalus unleashed the fury of his wrath against the Praetorians. He ordered the arrest and punishment of the guards, who had cheered Alexander openly and enthusiastically, pretending that these were responsible for the revolt and uproar. The Praetorians were enraged by this order, since they had other reasons also for hating Elagabalus. They wished now to rid themselves of so disgraceful an emperor, and believed too that they should rescue the Praetorians under arrest. Concerning this occasion ideal and the provocation just, they killed Elagabalus and his mother, Somias, for she was in the camp as Augusta. Together with all the attendants who were seized in the camp and who seemed to be his associates and companions in evil, they gave the bodies of Algobolus and Simaeus to those who wanted to drag them about and abuse them. With the bodies had been dragged throughout the city and mutilated corpses were thrown into the public sewer that flows into the Tiber. After having ruled the empire for more than five years, leading the kind of life described, Elagabalus perished in this manner, together with his mother. The Praetorians then proclaimed Alexander emperor and conducted him into the palace while he was still a youth and still being given a thorough education by his mother and grandmother. That was the fate of Elagabalus. Before I continue with more about Elagabalus, I just want to mention Alexander, his successor, who he named as Caesar. The religion of Alexander was a combination of pagan, Orphic, and Christian beliefs. The Historia Augusta claims that Alexander prayed every morning in his private chapel. He was extremely tolerant of Jews and Christians alike. He continued all privileges towards Jews during his reign. And Alexander placed images of Abraham and Jesus and Orpheus in his oratory, along with other Roman deities and classical figures. When you think of that, 
picture, it's actually not that surprising. This is kind of how most Christians were in this time period. When we look at the old catacombs, the early Christian catacombs, oftentimes you would see images of Orpheus and Abraham and Jesus in the same areas. But I just think it's interesting how we have Roman emperors long before Constantine that are venerating Jesus. Now, to go back to Elagabalus, there are many things written about him from the historians, such as that he wanted to transition into a woman and that he was willing to give half the empire to anybody who can give him a female genitalia. Cassius Dio states that Elagabalus was married five times and that one of these marriages was to Heracles, which was his chariot driver and another man named Zoticus, an athlete from Smyrna. Dio also says that Elagabalus prostituted himself in taverns and brothels and that he delighted in calling himself Heracles' mistress and he, he wore makeup, wigs, and preferred to be called a lady and not a lord. It's not quite clear if Cassius Dio is being biased here, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's true either, nor would I see that as something negative either but i do think it's interesting that herodian doesn't tell, talk about any of this which means there might be some truth in the middle there's even one story that says that he had so many roses thrown upon his party attendants that they smothered and died but i think the main thing that i can take away from elagabalus's reign that shapes the empire that follows him is his religious reforms. He did replace the Roman triad of Jupiter, Dea Roma, and Romulus with Elagabalus, Urania, Astarte. Elagabalus's religious reforms would set up the stage for later religious reforms that came under Aurelian and Constantine. And the traditional pagan Rome as we knew it would forever be changed after Elagabalus would never go back again. He died at age 18 in the year 222 and it will always be the wonder of the third century.